good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good night, depending on wherever you are in the world. And to the studio audience, welcome. I'm glad you were able to fight your way through the clamoring throngs and win the winning tickets to be present for John Levine's second talk at the Oxford Internet Institute. It gives me great pleasure to announce our speaker. John Levine is uh, well known as the mayor, of Tru the mayor of Trumansburg, New York, a town not unlike the town that people live in on The Simpsons. But actually, he's better known. He's even better known than that because he's the main author of a book called Internet for Dummies, which has sold an awful lot of copies, as well as the co-author of Unix with his sister, of Unix for Dummies, and, uh, and uh, other books which are more obscure. He was, for a time, the editor of the Journal of Sea Language Translation. And for, as far as political uh, smarts are concerned, he's a member of the ICANN uh, Advisory Board, he goes to the IT, IETF meetings, though whether one is a member of IETF or not is uh, a metaphysical question. And he has been an advisor to me on technical matters for over 35 years. I met him when I was 33 and he was 16, and he was already both authoritative, sardonic, and crisp in his ability to sum summarize extraordinary technical issues and cut right to the bleeding core. So I won't say any more. <clears throat> I'm very happy to announce John Levine, who will be talking on internet security, legend or myth. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, th the reason I actually thought to think about internet security is that last week I was at the ICANN meeting in Marrakesh, Morocco. And ICANN meets all over the world. In fact, the reason I was here last year is because I was coming from their meeting in Luxembourg. This time they're meeting in Marrakesh. And one of the unusual things about ICANN is that anyone can go to a meeting. And they will allow pretty much anybody to show up and sign up for they, with a, uh, for a you tell them who you are, get your name tag, and now you're a member of the meeting, and you can go to all the sessions and everything else. And so we, we've had a, uh, a matter of difference on our advisory committee about how secure are these meetings supposed to be. I mean, if anybody can show up and come in, Clearly, there's no attempt to make stuff secure. However, at a previous meeting, they wanted to make sure that you showed ID, and they took your picture, and, and you were who you were, said you were, which was kind of odd. So this time, as an experiment, I uh, decided to see who I, want, who I could be. So I printed up some business cards, which you probably can't see, but if you, but if you can, this says Mr. Charles Babbage, the Analytical Institute of Trumansburg, New York. And I handed them handed them the card, and I said, I, have, I said in my best schoolboy French, I've already registered. And they said, ah, oui, Monsieur Babbage, c'est vous, blah, 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 blah. You know, and so I, went, I spent my time at the meeting <laughs> as Mr. Charles Babbage from the Analytical Institute. So that this should give us a hint about the state of Internet security. And you know, as, the, uh, as the blurb for this, for this um, talk suggested, um, the internet is a place where you can't tell the difference between a crack house and, and your local druggist. It's a place where um, ill-mannered teenagers can effectively take over your car and start, and start driving it at random at high speed on the highway. So what I'm going to attempt to lay out in the next hour or so is how do we get here and what, if anything, can we do about it? Um, but I guess be before I, I ask how did we get here, I better make it clear where here is. Um, I mean, the latest horrible threat on the internet is what's called phishing with a PH. And if you have a bank account pretty much anywhere in the developed world, you have doubtless gotten an email purporting to be from your bank or some other bank saying, there's a problem with your account, we just need you to log in here and confirm a few little details. Um, or sometimes it says we've been having a sweepstakes log into our, our bank website here for your choice at winning whatever it is. Um, in one case in Canada, the bank through Phenomenal stupidity had an actual raffle for a car. So they were sending out fake, fake email for the car. Of course, the vast majority of this email is fake. Now, you know, I can tell because you know, I, get, I live in the United States, and I get mail telling me that my, my account at, uh, at Barclays or Lloyds Bank um, is, is in trouble and needs to be fixed. Well, they can't fool me. I do, not bar I do not bank at Barclays or Lloyds Bank. I bank at HSBC. But if I get junk mail that purports to be from HSBC, 
kind of hard to tell. Now again, I've liked Bank at HSBC in the US, and since I'm a sophisticated user, I can say, oh, this purports to be about my British account that doesn't exist. But in general, it looks real. How can you tell? And it's really hard. You know, and how do we get to a place where you can't tell the difference between the real stuff and the fake stuff? Um, and now we need to, to dive back 35 years, back to roughly when I met Ted and people were designing the internet. And I must make it clear that neither Ted nor I were any of these people. So I'm trying to explain it while not taking credit for it. And, um, and this is the distinction between the internet's design of what's known as a stupid network versus the telephone system, which is what we call a smart network. When you make a telephone call, I mean, you pick up your phone and you punch in the phone number, and, it's a, it's a, and it could be a, a phone number right here in Oxford, or it could be a phone number somewhere else on the other side of the world. You, as your call goes from switch to switch, it actually sets up sort of a little channel. Um, and originally, you know, operators would, would, would plug in cords. But originally, like, there, was, there was an actual copper connection of wires from your phone to the other person's phone. And now, well, they don't use copper. They use fiber and microwave and satellites and stuff. But there still is a, a distinct logical connection all the way from your phone to your friend's phone. And it has to go through eight phone switches on the way, which is not unusual if you're calling internationally, then each phone switch has to keep track of your call and has to say, okay, this, this little channel is, is dedicated to, to John's call, and then it hands it off to the next one and say, okay, yes, it's that call, and it, and it has to remember it. So that the number of calls that a switch can handle is basically limited by the ability of the switch to keep track of calls. And and the network is, very, is internally very sophisticated. It knows, all, knows about all the details of the calls, and it has all these wonderful built-in facilities of caller ID and, and three-way conferencing and ringback and all that stuff. And when they looked at the internet, there was actually attempts to build internet-style networks that worked that way. Um, there was a, a temporarily popular networking scheme called X25 that was widely used in the, uh, in the 1970s that, that worked the same way. And, um, and we don't hear about it much anymore, you know, and the question is, and why not? And the answer is because they had the wrong metaphor. Um, in one of the early editions of Internet for Dummies, I talked about the distinction between certified mail and registered mail. I mean, I don't know if they, if they have these two kinds of mail in England, but in the United States, registered mail is for packages of great intrinsic value. I mean, like, if, you're, if I wanted to mail you know, if I had my grandmother's wedding ring and I was going to mail it to my sister, I mean, that's a physical, irreplaceable object. So for registered mail, they, I take it to the post office and they seal it up with special tape and they sign it in and they put in log books and then they give the log book to the guy in the truck who then takes it to the next post office and, and who then, and they log it in very carefully at each stage until it finally gets to the other end and the other, and the, and the person at the other end signs for it. So at each stage, they very carefully know where it is. Certified mail, on the other hand, um, is simply mail where they, they log it in at when, when you send it, and it, they kind of send it the normal way. And when it gets to the other end, they log that it's been delivered. And if it gets lost, tough. I mean, you get your money back. And what certified mail is typically used for is the letter from your insurance company saying that, they, that, they, that, that you, better pay them, you better pay them more because they raised your rates because you made the unwise decision to be a year older than you were last year. Um, the difference between certified mail is if the letter gets lost, the letter itself has no, no particular value. If the letter gets lost, they'll just send another one. Um, so now if you're looking at a computer network where all you're sending around is little packets of photons and electrons, which model makes more sense as a model for computer networks? Well, clearly it's a certified mail network um, because sending copies of computer data is, is free. You know, It's just data. It's just bits. So the internet works more like certified mail. And they made the very clever decision in about 1975, to separate the end stuff, the logging of the data in and out, which this, be, this being computer, is it, it, needs, it needs an acronym. That's, that's TCP. So the, the TCP is the ends in and out that actually keeps track of the traffic, as opposed to the route through the middle, which is known as IP. Um, and the important f feature that gives is that as the stuff is passed on from, from point to point inside the network through what are called root, routers that connect one piece of network to another. Um, the routers have, need, need, have no idea what conversations it's passing traffic on. It's just passing along. It's less, less like 
is just like, you know, the, the, the mail, <coughs> the, uh, with, for the certified mail, you know, they pass this stuff through, they don't log it, they, keep, they, they don't keep track of it, they just say, okay, this is going to, you know, this, one, this one's going to Scotland, so we'll put it in that bin, and this one's going to Wales, so we'll put it in that bin, and then they forget about it. Um, so this meant that the, that the internal nodes in the network, the routers, are much, much simpler and much cheaper. I mean, my first internet router was a uh, 286 DOS PC, running at, I think, 8 megahertz. You know, as opposed to, the, I mean, the slowest computer you, get, you can get these days runs at about, what, 1,000 megahertz, 2,000 megahertz. It was really, really slow, and it worked fine. You know, and the router I have now on my network is an old, basically discarded PC that runs at 200. So, so the task of routing is very simple. The internal structure of the network basically has no idea of what's happening at the edge. So that's the problem. You know, it's good because it means it's very efficient to set up. It's bad because it means that all the security is at the edges. Basically, you inject it at this end, you remove it at that end, in between, there's no kind of, there's no regulation, there's no customs to make sure that the stuff going through is what it should be. So that um, the, the extent to which your network is secure entirely depends on the extent to which the computers at each end are secure. Now, when they first set up the internet, that seemed like a perfectly reasonable decision, and, and it was a perfectly reasonable decision. It made the, it made the internet much easier to build and much easier to grow than, than telephone-style networks. It's basically when you want to add a new piece to a telephone network, you need to get a big complicated phone switch and you need to make fancy, and you made, or not so much fancy arrangements, but, but formal arrangements with everybody you want to talk to, and not just the people to whom you're connected to directly, but all the people kind of downstream of them that you might eventually want to connect a call to. Whereas on the internet, basically, if you hang a little piece of network off some existing piece of network, you're done. I mean, if you get a, uh, a router at an electronics store, I mean, a little box, one end plugs into BT's DSL line, the other end plugs into however many computers you have in your house, whether with wires or with Wi-Fi. I mean, you've just hung a, little, a, a new little piece of network on the internet, and, and it'll work, and the rest of the net doesn't need to know about it. You know? So that's very nice. On the other hand, this now means that each computer in your house is now a security gateway to the internet. And that, that may be a problem. In, uh, in the olden days, back when the internet was first set up, and sort of in through well, in the middle of the 1980s, um, computers were big and expensive. And all the computers on the, the ARPANET, the predecessor to the internet, and then early, the early internet, were computers that were like, they were big, you know, they were the size of refrigerators. Each computer served a whole lot of separate, typically served a whole bunch of people, unless you were rich and had a research lab. Um, but you know, the first internet computer I used probably was serving 100 different people. It was run by a more or less professional staff. You know, the staff knew what they were doing. The staff maintained the logins and the passwords and stuff. And the only way you could get into that computer was by logging in. And when you logged in, you had very limited access to what the computer could do. I mean, I could log in and I could run my mail program, I could run my file transfer program, I could run a bunch of long forgotten services with names like Gopher. Um, you know, I could run my early web browser. But if I wanted to you know, install new software on the computer and make it do different things, I would have to talk to the, to the manager who for the most part would say no. Um, so that the individual computers were pretty secure. So that meant that what was going on in the network was pretty secure too. Um, it also helped that the early internet was funded by, it was funded centrally, by, originally by the American military and then by the American National Science Foundation and the analogous groups here on the side of the Atlantic. And so, you know, they had rules. You know, here's what you're allowed to do, and if you misbehaved, they would slap your wrist, and if you misbehaved again, they would kick you out. So the, so the penalties, there were penalties for bad behavior, and people behaved themselves. Ah, those were the good old days. Then starting around the middle of the 1980s, things just started to go to the dogs. And the, uh, the first indication of, of coming trouble was a system called SLIP, which was a way that you could put any PC on the net as an actual internet node using like a cheap dial-up modem, or if you were physically in a lab, just kind of a, a cable between your computer and some other computer. And it was kind of an experiment at MIT in Boston, and it worked, it worked okay, you know, but at that point, it was hard enough to do that 
that it was mostly just academics and students doing it. And the PCs were so feeble that, that it was enormous effort simply to get the same programs going on the PC that we were originally running on, on the larger machines. You know, so we might have had, instead of a gopher program, we would now have a web browser, which could sort of draw little pictures and stuff. But, but the connections were slow, and the people using them were not particularly malicious, and the number of people on the net was small. So that still, although we, now ha we had now moved the security perimeter out into these PCs, just sort of for practical reasons, the PCs were unlikely to do anything bad. Um, but then th things started to get worse as PCs became more capable, mail programs became more capable, and we had increasingly non-technical users. Because the fundamental problem with internet security, when the security is out at the edges, is that the people who run the computers don't care. It's like, if their computer works, that's fine. You know? And if their computer is doing all sorts of horrible things to other people, they don't want to know about it. It's like all I want to do is, you know, is is you know get my get my get my my free coupons for downloadable music or whatever it is they want to do. And other than that, they don't care. So, in the 1980s, we started to see computer viruses. Early computer viruses spread from computer to computer by floppy disks. But as email became more popular, we started to get viruses spreading by email. Um, Microsoft did the virus writers a huge favor by adding features to Microsoft Word that made it a programming language as well as a document editor, so now you could actually write viruses in Word, which people did, that would then mail, that would then, actually, and Windows was well enough integrated that the Word virus could actually extract addresses from your online address book and then mail copies of the virus to all of your friends pretending to be from you. you know, this was, it was a wonderful technical innovation for some definition of, tech, of, of wonderful. Um, sh after that, the viruses became more f sophisticated, uh, the mail programs before became more sophisticated, and they started doing us huge favors by not just opening Word documents, but if a, if a file showed up that seemed to be a program, the mail program would say, oh, I'll just run this. You know? And so basically, arbitrary people could send you arbitrary programs that would run on your computer to do arbitrary bad things. You know? And again, the user still didn't care. You know? So unless, it's, unless it messed up your, your computer so, off, so horribly that, it, that you couldn't, couldn't read your mail, you know, couldn't do your editing. And most of the viruses were designed to be not quite that malicious. They just sat there and people didn't care. Um, my, Microsoft made things worse by making mail programs that would go to extraordinary lengths to run and open um, executable programs, even if the mail didn't really make them look like executable programs, so that people would write virus filters and say, OK, well, this, this message is OK because it contains no programs. And then they would get to the mail pro program and they would say, oh, wait, wait, wait. That thing there, it's mislabeled. I see it's a program. I'll run it anyway. Ha! It's not, yeah. Well, they thought they were doing a favor. Um, and so once the bad guys can run a program on your computer, anything you can do, they can do. Um, on, the, on the current net, now that we have people with high-speed connections and we have individual PCs, I mean, our the laptops we're all using are much more powerful than the shared computers that we were using 20 or 30 years ago. Um, now, through a variety of security holes, it's very easy to in inject software into a Windows machine, take it over, turn it into what's called a zombie or a bot. And the bad guys then have, have remote control software that can control all these bots. And it's absolutely common to have botnets of 40,000 computers. And we have seen botnets with a million computers. And the bad guys can make these computers do what ever they want. You know, so mostly what they do is use it to send spam. And in fact, we're lucky that the worst thing they do usually is to send spam because they can do much worse things. I mean, there are a lot of clearly documented cases where there was some sort of computer fraudster who was on, who, who had a website hosted on a, on a network. Um, the network realized what he was up to, kicked him off. And the next thing you know, the network was, was, that was, was deluged by, by traffic sent from these botnets and it just knocked the network off the air for a few days. You know, it was really bad. And it, you know, it makes people somewhat more reluctant to deal with the bad guys than you would hope they would be. So, ah uh, yes. Then the other problem is that even if you're, if you're in control of your computer, I mean, like, I fancy myself to be in control of my laptop. And the reason mostly is that rather than running Windows or Mac software, I run FreeBSD, free a, a freeware system which is obscure enough 
that the bad guys have not bothered to, to try very hard to attack it. And it also has some built-in security stuff that makes it a little harder to attack than some of the more popular systems. It's better known as OS 10. Well, it's part of Mac. It's, it's part of, of it's, it's sort of, it's the, it's the, it, it's, it's the firm concrete underpinning of Mac OS 10 on, on top of which they put all the, the, the delicious fluffy gooey topping. Okay, but you know, th those of us without a sweet tooth just sit there and chew directly on the concrete. <laughs> um, but even with my computer, which I think, you know, as far as I know, there is no software running on my computer that I did not personally put there. Nonetheless, I still get fake bank mail. And the reason is that all websites look the same. Um, when people try to generalize from their personal experience of, of sort of authentication and security, I mean, like you're walking down the high street and you come to something which, you know, how do you tell whether it's a bank? You know, if you're walking down the street, you know, here's this thing, it says, you know, and somebody turns to you and says, do you think this is a bank? And you look at it and you can say, well, it is a large, sturdy stone building that clearly costs a lot of money to build. It has, it has attractive mahogany wood frames. If I look inside, it has counters and brass fittings and people in uniforms. Um, it has the name of, of a, you know, it says Lloyd's or HSBC on the window. Um, in the United States, the real banks all have um, stickers from the National Bank Insurance Company. They all say FDIC. And there's a lot of other countries where that's a good. But there's all sorts of clues, you know. And if I were a bad guy pretending to be a bank, it would cost a lot of money to build something that looked like a bank. I mean, there are tricks they can do. I mean, if, there, if, there's, if there's a teller machine, um, there have been stories of, of people wheeling up a box that says, normal teller machine broken, this temporary one provided for your convenience, we apologize for any confusion, you know, and they, they, they wheel it up in the, in, the, in the evening when the bank is closed, and then everybody puts their card in, and they steal the card information and the, and, and the pin, and then they quick wheel it away at 7 o'clock before the staff comes back. You know, so... Yeah, actually, yeah. The modern version is what's, it's what's, yeah, it's called what's called a skimmer. They just, they just, they can actually put it all, put it over the slot in the uh, in the machine, and they can, and they typically can, and they typically hide a camera um, somewhere to look, looking at the keypad to get to get the pin numbers. But yeah, I've, I've I've seen some of these kits. But these are these are relatively complicated and sophisticated. You need to have a certain amount of of technical expertise to do it, and it's somewhat possible to educate people that, like, if the teller machine looks different today than it looked yesterday, that's bad. However, on the net, it all looks the same. I mean, the, the, the web has genericized everything. Um, I mean, on your, you know, on a web page, all you can see is what your browser can show you. I mean, your browser is limited by both by the, what your screen can display, which by any sort of normal artistic standards is horribly coarse and simple. And it's limited by, by the coding that's possible to put in web pages. You know, and so you, I, go to, I go to my bank's website, and it's a very attractive looking website. But you know, it's got little pictures, of, pictures of, of happy customers, and it's got little buttons to click, and it has a picture of the bank's red and white logo. Um, you know, and it's a web page. And s since in computers anybody can copy anything, no, I'm not, not necessarily legally, but technically. I mean, making a copy of computer data is always very easy. Um, if I were a malicious Romanian teenager, it would not be very hard to take all of the all of the components of my bank's website and simply make a copy of them, you know, on a on a web server that I'm running in my in my bedroom, since the computers are now fast enough to do that, you know, and the, and and my fake website will look just like the real website. You know, and there's fundamentally, given the way the computers work, there's fundamentally nothing you can do about that. I mean, it's the exact same dots in the same place on the screen. You know, and there's, to some extent, you can say, well, like the line at the top should have the name of your bank instead of having the name of some Romanian ISP. But banks aren't really very good about that because, of course, the thing in the, in the, in the, li in the line is not actually, you know, it does not say, you know, like my bank is called the Tompkins County Trust Company. You know, and it does not say the Tompkins County Trust Company. It says, it says tctrustcode.com. You know, now I happen to know that tctrustcode.com is what they call themselves online. You know, but if I were a bad person, and I and I registered tompkinscodetrustcode.com or some other some other variation of the name of the bank, most people wouldn't know. 
You know, there's fund. The real banks do that too. Oh, the, the real banks. Well, the, the worst example I've run into, you know, of, of banks doing ridiculous numbers of names. Um, I've been doing some work with with Industry Canada, the in Industry Ministry in Canada, and there's only there's only five banks in Canada. So I did a little study, like what names do they use, and and they have sort of the usual variations of of you know the Bank of there's the Royal Bank of Canada, which is, and it's abbreviated RBC. So there's RoyalBank.com and RoyalBankOfCanada.com and RBC.com, and those are all pretty reasonable. But then I visited the Bank of Montreal, which was BankOfMontreal.com and BMO.com and BMO.ca and all that stuff. But in Canada, the banks also have stock brokerage arms. And it turned out the Bank of Montreal had registered a vanity website for every single one of their, of their stock brokers. So you'd go to you know, GeorgeSmith.com, and it turns out George Smith works for the Bank of Montreal, and you go to georgesmith.com, and it's George, you know, and it's a Bank of Montreal webpage, and here's George offering to sell you registered retirement plans or whatever it is he sells. You know, this is horrible. Like, I don't know who works for Bank of Montreal, and furthermore, even if George works there today, I don't know if he's going to be still working there next week. You know, and if all of George's clients have cards saying go to georgesmith.com to find his website, you know, if he goes and hops over to a different bank. You know, and uh, you know whether or not I do want to follow George or whether I want to stay with the same bank. You know, it was really, it was a bad choice. I mean, there would have been reasonable ways to do it. I mean, if they made it georgesmith.bmo.com, you know, then at least you would have him. This is George Smith at the Bank of Montreal. You know, and if later George Smith is at some other bank, you know, then later it could be georgesmith.royalbank.com. No, no, it's just it's this long list of, of sort of random people's names. It was a terrible choice because it, it completely diffused the bank's identity. And um, the banks in the United States haven't done anything quite that egregiously stupid, but, but they're definitely, I've seen banks in the United States, every time they come up with a new advertising campaign, they come up with a new website for it. You know, and so it's, you know, so, you know, so whatever your bank's name is, you know, they have a new campaign, you know, and all of a sudden they say, they, they, you know, they, they, they say, go to happyfundbanking.com, which turns out is actually, I don't know, Citibank or something like that. But again, no, happyfundbanking.com might be Citibank, whereas funhappybanking.com might be some random guy in China, and you can't tell. Um, so coming up with the clues for real identity is hard, and it, what's even worse is the normal intuition you would have. I mean, if something looks just like your bank, normally, I mean, like if you go to, you know, if you go to one branch of your bank, you know, and then you go to another branch of your bank, you'll say, well, this looks pretty similar, you know, like the columns are different, and the, you know, and the windows are are, are a slightly different size, and and the color of the stone is a little bit different, but basically, it's still got mahogany fittings and brass and tellers and counters and the same logos and everything, and you can kind of tell, so long as it looks similar, it's probably a bank. Whereas on the net, if it looks similar, might be a bank might not be a bank, you know, and particularly with the George Smith stuff. I mean, whereas, you know, here's the bank's regular website, here's the George Smith site, which looks really different and is real, you know, and here's some fake site, which is, which is, which looks almost exactly the same, but is fake. You know, so what do you do about this? Well. <sighs> they set up a whole phony office. Yes. With mahogany and a lot of guys. Yeah. But, but that, that demonstrates your point. That's so expensive and difficult to do in physical reality. Yeah, in physical reality, yeah, the only reason they did it was because they had one really rich sucker on the line. Yep. Yes, you know, and and again, you know, if I were, if I had enough resources, you know, I could, you know, well, basically, you know, if you have enough money, you don't have to pretend to be a bank. You can be a bank. <laughs> um, so what are we going to do? And there have been a lot of initially plausible issues that didn't, initially plausible, very clever looking ideas that just didn't work, including. Many of mine. So, you know, so it's, there's, there's sort of two overlapping um, problems that I'm talking about here. One is the phishing problem. How do you tell the real eBay, the real bank, the real whatever it is from the fake one? Okay. And the other security issue is basically spam. I mean, people are deluged with vast amounts of email that they didn't ask for and they don't want. And if you don't filter it, your mail will be useless. I mean, it, and my my personal accounts, I probably get it between 100 and 1,000 spam messages for every legitimate message. And if I didn't have some mechanical way to get rid of the spam, I could never find the real mail. So what am I going to do? Um, the initial approach, dating back to the days when the internet was mostly full of, of virtuous people, 
they would say, well, you know, just about everybody is nice, so we're just going to sort of blacklist the people who are bad, and everybody who's left will be nice. And this has been the, the main approach to, um, to um, spam fighting for the past decade. Um, the original blacklist was called the RBL, the real-time black hole list, because it was actually updated in real time as the guy who was maintaining it got new spam. And early on it worked pretty well, but it's worked worse and worse and worse. And these days, black holing is, is extremely, and, and blacklisting bad sites is extremely bad because of the zombie problem. When the bad guys can not only have 40,000 machines in their, in their botnet, but every day they have 40,000 new machines in their botnet. The rate of infection is just stupendous. I mean, the number of, of controlled machines is enormous. And um, I was at a meeting last week by some internet providers, and they say a typical botnet is, you know, it's used sort of for a week, and then it tails off for a month, and then they throw it away. Um, and then they get a new one. And so simply keeping track of all the machines that are being used to send spam is really hard. You know, I know people who try simply to track all the machines they, they get spam from and, you know, and, and log them into a blacklist that we all use. Um, you know, but they're adding like three million machines a day, and it's just you know, and they figure they're getting maybe a quarter, a tenth of all of the machines sending spam. It's just keeping track of the you know, identifying the bad guys and, and assuming that everybody else is good is appealing. You know, and, and again, it's sort of analogous to what we do in real life. You know, what the police do is they what they attempt to do is to lock up the criminals and assume that everybody left is okay. Um, the problem here is that we, we are, we are on, on the planet Z where the bad guys can shoot, can shoot poison darts at you from afar and turn you, into a, turn you into a zombie who will then make you a crook for a while while you are at the same time continuing to have conversations with your friends and relatives. Um, the how much does the, does the zombie slow down? It entirely depends. How much does the zombie slow down? It entirely depends on what they're doing with it. I mean, basically, they can infect you, and then they can sort of sit there. It can sit there waiting for instructions, and it's not slowed down at all. And then it, and, the, and then it slows down a lot while they're doing bad stuff. On the other hand, they, they can tell sort of geographically where you are. You know, they know if you're in the United States, or they know if you're in Europe. So that the smart ones, send mail to Europe from American zombies while the Americans are asleep, and then vice versa. You know, which, yeah, which has the advantage that you know, the people whose machines are being abused don't notice that they're being abused because they're asleep. And the people who are receiving it now have to do, you know, have to make at the very least an international phone call to talk to, to, to try and, and talk to the ISP whose machines are, are, are being controlled. You know, and that's, that's why they also like using, using, I mean, I got tons of zombie mail from Korea. And Korea turns out to be the ideal place to, to have compromised computers because they made, a, they made a huge national effort to give everybody really fabulous high-speed broadband connectivity. Um, they didn't train people very well, so the level of software maintenance is poor, um, so that it's very easy to take over machines in Korea. And in Korea, they speak Korean. And outside Korea, nobody speaks Korean. You know, so I can send emails saying, you know, please fix this. And I'm sure somebody looks at it and goes, huh. They have roughly the same reaction I would have if somebody sent me email in Korean telling me, please fix this. I mean, so I've gotten to the point where I basically can't, I don't accept any mail at all from Korea since I don't have any regular correspondence there. And I was, I'm just getting incredible amounts of spam. Yeah, in fact, I made up my little blacklist of Korean networks that have sent me spam, which I, don't, I seem not to be the only person who has this problem because word's gotten around and my, and my Korean spam blacklist is now vastly popular all over the world. Every once in a while, I get mail from somebody who says, somebody in Korea who says, who says in polite but broken English, I cannot send mail to friend in Malaysia, please to fix. Um, and about half the time, it turns out they're on a little university network that's OK. And I, I just, I, I can take them off the list. But sometimes they're just, they're on the big phone company network. And I write back and I say, you tell Cornet to fix their spam problem. And they say, I'm not sending spam. I say, I don't care. Your network's sending spam. You're paying the money. You fix it. They don't like that. But as it is now, I mean, I have to take these really coarse, sort of unpleasant actions. You know, and this probably means once or twice a year, somebody in Korea tries to send me mail and it doesn't work, which is sad. But given the alternative, which would be to get 1,000 spams a day from them, you know, it's what I got to do. Um, so marking the bad stuff was the first attempt. And it didn't work so good. So the second approach is you flip it around and you say, well, let's mark the good stuff. 
And the initial effort to mark the good stuff is what are called cryptographic certificates. And it's some very interesting mathematics that was done maybe 20 years ago. So basically, you, ha you have somebody who is the certifier, and they have what's called a signing certificate. And your web browser or your mail program can have a, typically a ship with a copy of a whole bunch of these signing certificates. And then when somebody wants to demonstrate their virtue, they then will apply to this company and says, I would like a certificate from you. And they do, <clears throat> they do some level of due diligence, um, with some level being a term we're going to get back to. Some level of due diligence. And then if they find you to be sufficiently virtuous, they will then provide you a certificate that's just good for your, your website, you know, www.somethingorother.co.uk. But with a digital signature, so they can then be, your browser can then go take your certificate and compare it to the signing certificate it already has. And if they match, then it'll say, OK, this, this company really did vouch for this website, and they really are who they say they are. Sounds great, except that we had a fairly severe race to the bottom. Um, originally, making these certificates was quite expensive. The first time I got one, um, I got it from a company in South Africa called South Africa called Thought, that had a subsidiary in actually uh, they, 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 their American subsidiary was in North Carolina or something. But I had to send copies of my business certificate and my driver's license and you know and and all this stuff to show that I was who I said I was and my company actually existed and all this stuff was real. And they charged me about three hundred dollars, you know. And by golly, I got a great certificate, you know, that proved I was very, very authentic. Well, time passed, and thought was bought out by other people, and and some other people discovered that gee, there are sort of historical reasons. There are about thirty or forty of these signing certificates built into people's web browsers, and they said, you know, if we could get control of one of these of one of these signing certificates, it's basically the license to print money because people will come to us and pay for you know, pay for this ver verification, which, which we can do kind of cheaply and easily. And, you know, and we'll make big bucks. And so we had a race to the bottom. So the current standard for web certificates is that it costs $14.95. And the verification consists of they send an email to the registered address, that you, the registered email address when you got your domain, which you then have to, it has a web URL that you click on. And then you have to give them a phone number, which can be anywhere. And they say, OK, we're going to call your phone number. Your, 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 your secret code is you know, 2468, at which point they then call the phone number. And then a, a robot says, this is, your, this is your verification telephone call. They say, punch in your code. You say 2468. It says, please state your name. And you say, Donald Duck. And it says, thank you. And about 30 seconds later, you get your signed certificate, and you're done. The whole thing took five minutes. So this is not, by any normal standards, a high quality verification of assurance. This basically is analogous to me being Mr. Babbage. Um, so this has been totally cheapened. You know, there, it's just if you're going to make a list of good people, you got to have to you have to have it be, be meaningful. You know, at this point, the list of people with signed web certificates is strictly listed to strictly limited to everyone in the world who has fifteen dollars in a telephone. Um, and even in Romania, they have $15 in the telephone. So what's the approach now? Well, there's two sort of separate things. One is that they, is they say, no, no, we're going to do it differently now. So there's the traditional web certificates where the little bar in your browser turns yellow. And they say, no, we're going to have really good web certificates that still cost like $1,000. And we're only going to give them to large, respectable companies. And instead of being yellow, they will be green. So I think the green certificates will work OK, at least until people discover that it's not hard to write zombie code that, writes, that puts a green stripe pretty much anywhere on your screen that you want. Um, but you could try to make your, your software more zombie resistant. And there's whole sorts of arguments about how hard that might or might not be. Um, but what we really need to do, though, is to move the, basically move the security perimeter back into something that's secure. I mean, the problem with the thing pretending to be your bank is that, you know, it's basically it's, it's software on your computer attempting to verify that it's the bank. And there's nothing on your computer that really has any idea what's a bank or what's not. So an approach that is much more expensive for the bank, but that is much more likely to work, is basically to send you a little thing that you can plug into your computer that has some, it basically has some secret key, key information that only the bank knows. And this, this device is not programmable. 
It's a dongle, yeah. I mean, it's a dongle that plugs in. So basically, you plug it in, and then when you want to do a transaction on your website, um, it then sends the tra it, it then sends the sends a coded message to the dongle in the code that only the bank understands. So even even if there's zombies running all over inside your computer, um, since only the dongle and the bank have the keys to this code, all the, all the all the zombie code could do to it is is break it. They can't rewrite it. So basically, it goes to the dongle, and the dongle then shows a little line saying, you know, you are you are transferring 114 pounds to Tesco. You know, click the button if that's what you want. And that's actually pretty secure, you know, unless they do something stupid like make the dongle programmable. But in general, so long as the, do so long as the dongle is not programmable and can't do anything interesting, you know, basically what we're doing is we're going back to, remember the early computers, the, the shared ones? You could log into them from like a terminal, but you couldn't, but the terminal couldn't do anything. I mean, the, term, the functions of the terminal couldn't be changed. Um, you know, and the functions, that, you know, and the, and, the, and the computer you were dealing with, you couldn't change. So basically, you need something that you can't change, and that's the dongle. Which, and my guess is for things like banks, where banks are all infinitely rich, and they all have the ability to foist off costs on their customers so they don't really have to pay for it. You know, and particularly for banks, you know, what banks are actually selling is confidence. You know, like you put your money in the bank, and they promise that when you come back later, you can have your money back. You know, and the reality is that it's not like the it's not like there's gold bars sitting in the vault. You know, it's off being in anything from um, local mortgages to random options on bonds in in the third world. You know, but basically, you you <clears throat> what the bank is selling you is is the confidence that that they are not they will not screw up so badly that when you come back to get your money ten years later, it'll be there. You know, and so I would think the dongle was probably a pretty cheap way to maintain confidence in a bank. Um, beyond that, though, you know, what can we do sort of in general? You know, and part of it, you know, I've, it's, it's, it's really a hard problem trying to figure out, you know, how to make computers less programmable. You know, because the problem is that, you know, we used to use just like dumb terminals. All they could do is you, know, you could type on the keyboard and the text would come back, you know, and... 30 years ago, you know, we had these text-only keyboards, and the state of the art in, in video entertainment was what's, what's called video text, which basically was a terminal where it could sort of draw little cartoons on your screen. But again, you could, you could send text, and it could basically send back a picture to be drawn on your screen, and that's all it could do. You know? And the good news is that was really secure, and the bad news was it was really boring. I mean, the only people who made any significant use of video text was the French with Minitel. And what they used it was, was since France is a, is, a, is a very expressive language for romance, they used it to do hot chat to send, to send um, um, you know, to, to set up dates and liaisons and stuff like that. And, you know, it worked fine because, cause, you know, it, I guess the French have good enough imaginations that you don't need the picture to believe it's someone you want to have a date with. Um, so... But we have this problem that as the computers became more versatile, you know, what makes your Windows machine so great, you know, is that you can run any program on it you want. You know, Windows shows up with some small set of programs that had a little text editor and a little browser and stuff like that. But, but the br browser that comes with it is set up so that people can actually add new stuff to it, you know, that can, that can play games and render stuff and, you know, and be nice little spreadsheets and, and you know, and, and 3D visualization and stuff. It's really cool stuff, but you know, it's sort of everything you can do that's cool, a bad guy can do something bad. Um, so, you know, so the whole issue of how do you let do th people do things that are cool without letting them do things that are bad is, is the fundamental problem we have to solve to make the internet more secure. And there are there are a couple of things that, we're work that we've been working on that sort of make a trusted core of the net, which is sort of back to this thing that, that people are, can't break into too easily. Um, and sort of and put, put the important stuff there and have some way to be reasonably confident that when you think you're talking to the trusted core, you really are talking to the trusted core. Um, but that's more of a concept than a project now. And, um, you know, we, the question is, can we do something that that's like, basically gives you the security effect of a dongle without being as horrible as a dongle? You know, the, problem with it, the problem with a dongle is that it is a physical device. It probably costs a pound to make. Um, it's the size of your thumb, which means that you're going to lose it. Um, you know, and there's the whole issue of admit, like if, if, you know, if you call up the bank and say, I lost my dongle, send me another one, you know, like, should they believe you? 
you know, and and <clears throat> I mean, it's it's you know, it's the whole same issue as well. Well, chip and pin was supposed to be the same thing. The chip is physically on your on your on your bank card is physically secure. Is that going to you know is that going to solve the problem? Well, no. Um, so so the whole issue about you know how do you how do you how are you going to come up with stuff that is hard to change is it's a hard one. You know, since it basically, it goes against everything we've been doing with computers for the past 30 years. Um, I mean, Microsoft's approach, which is, which is totally ridiculous, is on the one hand, they have a sort of, they have a signing scheme. You know, you, if you, if you want to have a little, a little component to be added into Windows, you can send it off to Microsoft to get it signed, which there's some vetting that goes on, but I think that the main thing that getting your, your, your module signed proves is that you have a fixed mailing address in $1,000. So and I don't, personally, I don't understand how I could verify that if somebody simply presented with a, me with a program and said, here, you know, check that this doesn't do anything bad and sign it. I mean, there's no way you can check, that, check what it can, everything that a, a black box piece of code does. Um, so Microsoft's approach is, well, if it's signed, you assume it's good. And if it's not signed, you say, hey, it's not signed. What should I do? And having looked at the at micro, at test versions of Microsoft's latest version of Windows, it puts up one of these, hey, should I do this? warnings about every 10 seconds. And so, yeah, so what they're doing is they're very clear, they're, they're, they're very carefully training us to go, yes, 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 you know, so no doubt one of those, we sh it should have been no. And they'll say, why didn't you say yes? You should have said, you obviously should have said no. And it's like, huh? I, you know, like, you know, which one was it? So, you know, and again, this is basically expecting people to care about security, which they don't, you know. And so can consumer education help? You know, to some extent, you know, to, you know, I think, I mean, we, certainly in the U.S. and in Canada, we've been, we've been educating people to say, like, if, you're, if, if somebody writes to you and say, this is your bank, you need to do this right away, they're lying. You know, the only, I mean, the most urgent thing my bank will ever, say, will ever send me is an email saying, could you call us, please? You know, when I, you know, the, the reality of bank security is, like, I have a bank card at a bank in New York, and I was in Marrakesh, and I bought a rug, so I took... Not a very big. It was a. It was a. It was a three hundred dollar rug, you know. But it was cheaper if I paid cash, you know. So I went to a bank machine in Marrakesh and I sucked out two hundred dollars and another hundred dollars, you know. And I've never been in Africa before, you know. So the next thing I knew, I got a, <clears throat> a beep on my voicemail from my bank saying, <clears throat> "Could you call us, please?" You know. And I called them and, and they authenticated me the way they usually do. And then I said, you know, they said, "There's this problem." And then I said, "Oh, if somebody's been cleaning out my bank account in Marrakesh, it's okay. It's me." You know, but that's, nobody's going to, but they're never going to write me and ask me to verify this online. You know, it's, it's all going to be me contacting them and them, you know, and again, it's like if you call a known phone number, like that's a real world thing that's, that's very hard to spoof. And also, yeah, they say, you know, call the number that is on, you know, call the regular number that's on the back of your card. You know, yeah, well, they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're a bank. They're not totally stupid. You know, and so, to, so, you know, training people like if you want to contact your bank, call the number on the back of the card or, you know, type in the, the, the name in your, in your browser that you always type in, you know, not some random happy fun bank that showed up in some piece of mail. Um, so, you know, so you can sort of treat, you can try to educate people to the idea that, that if it looks bogus, it probably is bogus. But beyond that, you know, people don't understand security, you know, and sort of trying to foist it off on people say, well, you know, it's your fault for not recognizing that the little pixel here that should have been pink was actually rose. Um, and so, so what we've done, you know, we've, we've built ourselves a monster here. And I think there are some ways, you know, like with, with the extra hardware like the dongles, I think some parts of the net can be made secure. But I think a certain, a lot of it is simply going to have to be people realizing that, that, the, that the net will never again be the, the sort of the, the happy walled garden it was when, when only approved researchers can get in. We might well build these small walled gardens for the happy researchers again, but you know, but the net, but the net as a whole, I think is pretty much stuck being, you know, as as confusing and insecure as as the real world is, with the extra overlay that everybody is equally close, you know, and when you know when you get email. It's just as likely to be someone across, from someone across the street as from someone as from someone around the world. You know, so in some sense, that's sad. You know, but I think that you know the penalty of being able to communicate with everybody you want to talk to is that you also end up communicating some with with, pe with people you don't want to. So I think 
partly we're going to fix it with better hardware. Partly we may be able to make sort of this, this trusted overlay that will give us sort of a, a trustworthy network that we can plug our dongles into. And partly we're just going to get, have to get used to it. So I'm afraid that's the state, state of internet security. You know, is the question is whether it's a legend or a myth. I would have to come down on the side of, of legend because if it's a myth, we definitely know it's not true. Or if it's a legend, we think it's not true, but there's just the faint hope that it might actually have a kernel of reality in it somewhere. So I'm hoping there is a kernel of security in there somewhere, and that when I come back next year, I can tell you that we found something. So thank you. Okay. <laughs>